Well, first and foremost, I'm very honored to be here today, and I'm very thankful and appreciative of all of the efforts and hard work of all of the founders of HPARA who made this conference possible and who gave me the opportunity to come and talk to you today about uh, the problem of sham peer review, which is a worldwide problem. It's a growing problem. And I think as Don mentioned, the Association of American Physicians and Surgeons, of which I am on the board of directors, we are officially affiliated with HPARA. The first thing I want to make clear is this talk is about bad faith peer review. It's not about good faith peer review, which I, AAPS, and other ethical physicians fully support. So all peer review is not bad faith peer review. That's not what I'm saying. Good faith peer review should be collegial, educational, fair, done for the purpose of improving quality care and protecting patients, and it should incorporate substantive due process for the accused physician. This talk will also touch on abuse of the disruptive physician label, not about truly disruptive physicians who exhibit bad behavior, bad behavior, such as those who repeatedly scream and yell obscenities, run naked or drunk through the halls of the hospital, threaten to bodily harm others, or those who throw sharp instruments in the OR to make a point. So let's start with the definition of sham peer review. And this is a somewhat legalistic definition, but it is an adverse action taken in bad faith by a professional review body for some purpose other than the furtherance of quality health care and that is disguised to look like legitimate peer review. Uh, in the U.S., it's sham peer review is typically carried out in a hospital setting via a trial-like proceeding uh, that can best be described as a kangaroo court. And a kangaroo court, of course, is an elaborately scripted event intended to appear fair while having the outcome predetermined from the start. So the short definition of sham peer review is it's, it's abusing the peer review uh, process to get a doctor, and it's not based on anything having to do with patient care. In sham peer review, the truth and the facts don't matter because the outcome is predetermined and the process is rigged. And as you probably know, sham peer review has a lot in common with bullying. The predators or bullies are those who have power over others. The victims are those who are generally in a vulnerable position. And then there's the enablers, the bystanders, who are aware of the bullying or sham peer review that is ongoing and who do nothing to stop it. There are numerous underlying motives for sham peer review, and you've heard some of these today, anti-competitive motives, turf battles, retaliation against a physician whistleblower, discrimination, professional jealousy, personal animus. Uh, there are sometimes physician hospital contracts that go sour. Uh, the physician is not bringing in enough revenue for the hospital, and the best way for them to dissolve the contract is to remove the doctor's uh, privileges. Um, the disruptive physician label is used in our country uh, fairly extensively. And it's the most lethal label that a physician can be given in a hospital today. The disruptive physician label is typically followed by a sham peer review that either uh, ends the physician's medical career or totally ruins it. And the term disruptive physician is purposely general, vague, subjective, and undefined so that hospital administrators can interpret it to mean whatever they wish. It, it follows the Humpty Dumpty rule in the book Through the Looking Glass. When I use a word, it means just what I choose it to mean, neither more nor less. And that's the way that this is applied. This uh, term disruptive physician is applied in the US. There are also legal seminars in our country that teach hospital administrators how to do sham peer review, how to dot all the I's, cross all the T's, so that it goes through smoothly. And also the uh, Joint Commission a number of years ago, the Joint Commission is the main accrediting agency of hospitals in the US. They developed a new standard which uh, allows nonverbal behaviors to be used as, quote, evidence against a physician to support the disruptive physician label. So now such things as facial expression, body language, and even tone of voice can be used as so-called evidence to show that uh, the physician is entitled to the disruptive physician uh, label. So it depends on how a person feels. 
it, there is no actual evidence uh, to support that. The disruptive physician profile, as taught in legal seminars throughout our country, includes such things as whistleblowers who are considered disruptive physicians, economic competitors, politically incorrect people. If you're a strong adver advocate for quality health care, that's considered disruptive. They're often described as charismatic, energetic, creative, and charming. Uh, independent thinker is another part of the disruptive physician profile, again as taught by uh, these legal uh, seminars. Uh, so uh, highly competent is one of the uh, things in the profile. Makes rounds at odd times. Uh, inappropriate nonverbal behavior as per the new Joint Commission standard. And I like this last one in particular, defends himself vigorously when attacked. <laughs> So if you vigorously oppose and say, look, I'm not disruptive, this, has, this is totally bogus, uh, that's part of the disruptive physician profile. <laughs> now I've researched this a bit, having been contacted and spoken with hundreds of physicians and their attorneys over the years, and so there, I, I've come to realize there are certain risk factors for uh, being a victim of sham peer review. So these are factors that increase the risk of being targeted for sham peer review. Solo physicians, small group physicians, new physicians, and physicians who are not in the clique. And the common factor there is lack of political power and connections in the hospital. Economic competitors, if you compete against a hospital in, in something, like an MRI scan or something like that, or you're competing against other uh, powerful physicians in the hospital, that can get you attacked. Whistleblowers, as we've heard. And again, whistleblowers are those generally who are strong advocates for quality patient care and safe patient care. Economic outliers, again, treating sicker than average patients can cost the hospital money. And so that's one of the risk factors. If you start treating very sick patients that require a lot of treatment or more days in the hospital, uh, it may be painting the target on your back. I've also come to recognize that there are certain high-risk specialties. These specialties tend to be attacked more often than others. It includes cardiology, especially interventional cardiology, neurosurgery, OBGYN, anesthesia, surgical specialists, psychiatry, and ER physicians. Foreign physicians are at risk, innovators, entrepreneurs, highly competent, skilled physicians are at risk, third-party free physicians, which I won't go into, and older physicians. Again, the common factor is that anything that makes a physician different from the rest of the herd increases the risk of sham peer review. So just how far will some go to get rid of a physician? Uh, there's the case of Michael Fitzgibbons. And this doctor was an infectious disease specialist. He had black gloves and a gun planted in his car and an anonymous caller called 911, which is the uni universal emergency number, and accused him of road rage. So he called up, and by the way, we posted the, um, the actual recording that this guy called in, said he saw a man in a white coat waving a gun in traffic, and he thought it was road rage. The event, of course, never occurred at all. Uh, but the police did come and take the doctor out of the hospital, handcuffed him, took him down to the police station, uh, strip searched him, and put him in a cell for a while. Uh, while. They also took his car after searching it and put it in the police impound lot. So when they finally released the doctor, uh, he came out to his car in the police impound lot, and sitting on the front seat was a bag of drugs, illegal drugs. And uh, of course that occurred after the police searched it, so the implication is that some of the police were in on this and planted the drugs in his car. He also had the tires of his car slashed, which by the way has happened in at least two other cases I've encountered. Uh, it's done with a box cutter knife in a certain way, usually on the inside of the tire so you don't see it, and it causes the tire to deflate gradually, uh, but more faster at high speed. So if you go out on a throughway or something at 75, that's when it tends to blow. So in this case, they did slash the, the uh, doctor's uh, tires, and it did result in a catastrophic tire failure with his 23-year-old daughter driving it on the freeway. Car went over out of control, flipped over, but fortunately neither his daughter nor the Japanese exchange student who was riding with her were injured. And um, 
this is published at the, uh, on our journal website, which you can see down there in yellow. Uh, this is fully supported by sworn uh, deposition testimony. And in fact, if you click on the references in this article, you can go directly to the depositions and read yourself how the president te of the hospital testified against the CEO who spent $10,000 to make this happen. He gave the $10,000 to someone who is affiliated with the mafia to do these things. Then there's the case of Raymond Long, Dr. Long. And they tried, they tried and tried to get Dr. Long on, on various uh, peer review matters, but couldn't find anything he was doing wrong. So make long story short, what they did, somebody did in the hospitals, they deliberately contaminated irrigation fluids that were used during surgery. Uh, this was an orthopedic surgeon who did arthroscopic procedures, uh, mainly on the shoulder, and it turns out that that's a very, that has a very low rate of infection. So the idea was is that they were going to accuse this doctor of having, having higher post-operative infection rates, and they were going to use that as the peer review to get rid of him in the hospital. The, mad, the doctor hired a former CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, uh, outbreak infection investigator who investigated it and uh, came to the conclusion that it was deliberate contamination by three uh, highly unusual uh, bacteria and in fact the bacteria were pan sensitive that means they were sensitive to all usual antibiotics and as you know that does not happen in the environment these were bacteria that were purchased by the hospital to use in control procedures in the microbiology laboratory and in fact, they did find that the hospital had purchased those very uh, organisms shortly before this occurred. Uh, it got worse. Someone illegally entered the doctor's house and put meth methamphetamine, lithium, and mercury into orange juice he had in his refrigerator. And the doctor and one of his friends got sick after, um, after drinking it. He had the orange juice taken to uh, a lab for testing, and it was confirmed that these elements were in them. Again, his, his uh, tires on his car were slashed on three separate occasions, car broken into three occasions with things stolen, and uh, some of these uh, people who did these things made multiple c phone calls to his uh, parents and even uh, came to his parents' house on one occasion, said that they were looking for him. So again, this is published in our journal. All the references are, are, are there. And what I'd like to talk about now are the tactics that are characteristic of sham peer review. It turns out that these are universal tactics uh, worldwide. And I've been contacted by physicians in other countries, countries other than Australia, and these same tactics uh, are used all over the place. So these are the, uh, these are the links to the articles that have been published uh, on this that I've authored, and uh, I've also updated the list uh, recently. The following is not an all-inclusive list of tactics which are characteristic of sham peer review, and it is a constantly updated list. So as I learn more by talking with physicians usually throughout the country or their attorneys, their lawyers, I learn of new tactics, I put it on the list. So I'll try and tick through most of these uh, fairly quickly. There's the uh, ambush tactic, uh, which is generally the case where the doctor is, is told, look, come to a friendly, informal meeting in the hospital CEO's office. We have something to talk to you about. But they don't tell him what it's about. And he gets in there, and he finds himself sitting across from the hospital's attorney, the CEO, the chief of staff, the chief of whatever his department is. And all of them, of course, know exactly what it's about. And, and so they start bringing up the charts and whatnot and asking him, him about cases that he has not yet had an opportunity to review. Then there's secret investigations. Unfortunately, secret investigations go on all the time. They can last for months, sometimes years. Secret, again, the doctor knows nothing about it. Uh, number two, depriving the accused physician of charts, complaints, instant reports needed to defend himself. That's pretty bad. I mean, you're expected to defend yourself, but yet they're not going to give you the information you need to do that. Uh, again, because of uh, our federal law, known as HICWA, the Health Care Quality Improvement Act, which was passed in 1986, physicians are presumed guilty uh, prior to the peer review hearing, and the burden is then shifted to the physician to prove his innocence by a preponderance of the evidence, which again is the 51% type figure that you heard early about, earlier about. The numerator without denominator tactic turns out to be a tactic that is most often used in surgeons. 
uh, what, will, what they will do, what the hospital will do is they will say, look, you had two terrible complications. Doesn't matter if there are known complications of that surgery, and all surgeons have complications. If you meet a surgeon that says he doesn't ever have complications, he's lying. So they cite maybe a couple of cases where you've had terrible complications, we have to take action against you to protect patients. But there's no denominator. What you need to compare from one surgeon to the next is a rate of complication, and a rate involves both a numerator and a denominator. So they uh, intentionally omit telling what the denominator is. That is, how many cases of that type does the doctor do per year, and how many complications occur uh, out of that number. And the hospitals have got onto this and said, published, they, they hate that I published their playbook. This is the hospital playbook of dirty tricks, and they don't like me for having published this. Uh, so they realized that the numerator without denominator tactic that I've named is out there. So now what they're doing is they're manipulating the denominator. <laughs> they're trying to manipulate the denominator so as to show a higher complication rate, for example. Misrepresenting the standard of care. This was touched on a little bit earlier. And, and uh, in surgery, for instance, the, and in medicine in general, there's more than one uh, way to do things. There's, there's more than one legitimate type of uh, treatment or, or procedure used in surgery. But what the hospitals typically will do is they'll hire an external expert, usually for a fee of thirty to forty thousand dollars. It's a very luc lucrative business. And that doctor will say, well, you know, I never would have done surgery that way on that particular patient and therefore this doctor in your hospital is practicing beneath the standard of care. But there are, of course, legitimate professional differences of opinion as to how things can best be done in individual patients. So that's misrepresentation of the standard of care. False and or trumped up charges. That, is, of course, is uh, self-explanatory. Abuse of the disruptive physician label, which we've talked about. Uh, this next one uh, occurs quite a lot. And it really uh, avoids uh, confronting a logical error. That is, dredging up old cases to justify a summary suspension. A summary suspension is the harshest action that can be taken against a physician. It's, it's immediate suspension of the doctor's privileges to practice in the hospital, and it implies that the doctor is an imminent threat to uh, patients and patient care in the hospital. So what happens is the hospital will go back maybe three years and say, well, you know, three years ago he did such and such, supposedly, so we need to suspend him now. But if you knew that three years ago, you know, it, it, it avoids the logical flaw. Why didn't, you, why didn't you suspend the doctor back then? It's because it's not legitimate, of course. Ex parte communications in peer review, uh, this, uh, this is where uh, they will sit behind closed doors with the hospital attorney and maybe the hearing panel in the hospital and they will talk about the doctor without the doctor or his uh, counsel being present to hear what they have to say and be able to respond. A uh, hospital attorney or a conflicted attorney used to influence the peer review process, that's fairly self-explanatory and bias, which is self-explanatory. Uh, refusal to allow an independent record of the peer review hearing. So in court cases, generally, there is an official court reporter who has no interest in the case. They're professionals. They take down what people say. But oftentimes in hospitals, the hospital says, don't worry about that. We will keep our own record of what people said. And we will not allow you, doctor, to go out and hire your own court reporter to take down the record. Uh, improper and or false report to the National Practitioner Data Bank, uh, flaws in logic. There was one GI physician that called me that said his hospital told him he was not competent to do endoscopies on weekends, but he could continue to do endoscopies on weekdays. <laughs> and a family practice physician was told he could not admit patients of other physicians for whom he is cross-covering but he can continue to admit his own patients for the same type of medical conditions. And he was told he must send patients of other physicians for whom he is cross-covering to the hospital-employed hospitalist for admission. See a little financial incentive factor going on there? Uh, Fifteen, failure to follow medical staff bylaws or 
changing the bylaws in the course of peer review to favor the hospital and to put targeted physician at disadvantage. So believe it or not, and this is done by attorneys generally, they'll alter, you know, get the bylaws altered and then try and apply it retroactively to the doctor under peer, peer review so as to disadvantage the, uh, the doctor. Uh, the, the pulse uh, surveys conducted on a single physician at a facility. Uh, these, these are basically uh, workplace uh, surveys that are done electronically. And they're supposed to be applied like either hospital-wide or to a particular department where the nursing staff and others who interact with the physician have to put in, you know, their opinions of, of the physician, his care, and conduct. But when you do it on a single physician, you know, that kind of puts the spotlight on that, hey, why are they doing this on one guy? There must be a problem. Attributing the deficiencies of the hospital or others to the targeted physician. So this is like the pot calling the kettle black. And the hospitals do this all the time. If it's a hospital deficiency, they, they won't own up to it. They'll say, well, it's the doctor. It's his, it's his problem. Uh, breach of peer review confidentiality. That was talked about a little earlier. Ignoring favorable findings of a hospital's own external review. So their intent on, the hospital's intent on getting the doctor, and they send the charts out for external review. And the external review comes back and says, gee, I think he did a pretty good job. Guess what? They then ignore that and they proceed with the hospital peer review to find the doctor uh, guilty. Uh, and then there's attempts I've seen more recently to pass off a non-peer review report as if it were valid peer review. And the case that comes to mind uh, is uh, the case of uh, Jesse, Dr. Jesse Cole versus St. James Healthcare. And believe it or not, this was a case where the peer review was performed by an attorney who was not a physician. The entire peer review was done by an attorney, and it was the hospital's attorney, uh, an attorney hired by the hospital. And uh, the judge in that case uh, gave the hospital and the uh, attorney uh, quite a tongue lashing, and it's very gratifying to read. We have it posted. Uh, it said it wasn't peer review at all. You know, it was done by an attorney. And there's other examples of that. Uh, misleading the targeted physician about data bank reportability. The main thing in the U.S. that converts a local adverse action to a professional death sentence is a report to the National Practitioner Data Bank. It is a nationally run data bank which all hospitals have to query before they put a doctor on staff at the hospital and they have to query it every two years at which time the doctor is reprivileged in the, uh, in the hospital. And so what has happened in some of these cases is the uh, so-called leadership at the hospital that's usually financially dependent, these are physicians financially dependent on the hospital, they reassure the poor victim, look, this will go best for you if you just admit to doing this and we'll, if we're not going to report, we'll let you resign and we won't report it. Uh, because of this federal law known as HICWA, if you resign while the investigation is open, has not yet been closed, you are reported to the National Practitioner Data Bank, but they don't tell this to the uh, targeted physician. And then, as I mentioned, retroactive uh, application of new medical staff bylaws or policies. I find this totally repugnant that attorneys do this, attorneys who obviously should know better that you can't apply laws and regulations retroactively. So survey question by a show of hands. Are any of the tactics reviewed in this presentation fundamentally fair to physicians subject to peer review? And do any of these tactics comply with due process for the accused physician? Anybody think that they do? OK, so let the record reflect that no hands uh, have been raised. So in, in summary, and it looks like we'll have a, a few minutes for questions. In, in summary, uh, the core problem that we're talking about here is sham peer review. I didn't touch on it too much, but anonymous uh, complaints to medical boards and regulators is also a problem. And uh, we found this uh, in one of our states in Texas, we meaning AAPS, that a particular uh, physician competitor was using complaints to the medical board to sort of get rid of competition. Okay, so AAPS sued that medical board. I don't think any medical association other than the AAPS has had the guts to sue a medical board, but we did. And it turns out that in that process, uh, five out of six of the problematic individuals on the medical board 
got out of there. They resigned. Okay. Uh, so what are some of the thoughts on solutions? I don't, uh, I'm, I'm not arrogant enough to think I can come to your country and tell you what the solutions are. These are just a few thoughts on what the solutions might be. I do think that physicians must take the lead on this problem, and they must insist on due process and fundamental fairness in peer review, and ostracize those physicians who perpetrate sham peer review. Physicians who participate and perpetrate sham peer review, you just ought not deal with them. I mean, you've got ethical colleagues you can deal with and you can refer patients to, but if there are unethical people who have done these sorts of things to others, I mean, I, thought, I think there ought to be some sort of social stigma in the medical profession where the ethical physicians stand up and say, you know what, we don't approve of what you're doing and we're not going to deal with you. I do think you need to advocate for legislation that would eliminate anonymous complaints. Anonymous complaints are terrible. It's the sniper sitting in the grass and taking shots, and you don't know who it is, and it's hard to respond to Mr. Anonymous. I mean, one of the fundamental uh, things of due process and fundamental uh, fairness is that you should be allowed to cross-examine your accuser and see what evidence he or she can bring forth against you and ask them about it. But you can't depose or cross-examine an anonymous person. So anonymous complaints, that really has to be uh, eliminated. And that involves anonymous complaints made to medical boards, regulators, and uh, there needs to be some means to hold accountable those who file these spurious bad complaints. They, sh they should not be allowed to get away with that. Uh, and I think there's a need to publicly expose the problem. Again, uh, for whistleblowers in particular, there's some protection in that. What you don't want to be is you don't want to be the lead guy out front, the only guy whistleblowing because, you know, you might as well just paint the target on your back and turn around and let them shoot you. So you need, if you're, if you're going to make whistleblowing complaints, you do need to do it with a group of colleagues so that there is at least some uh, support. Um, and again, uh, I think there needs uh, to be increased transparency and the regulators, whoever they are, need to be accountable. This idea that some are uh, absolutely immune from their actions is, ab is absolutely ridiculous. Absolute immunity, like absolute power, corrupts absolutely. And there should not be this absolute immunity, particularly uh, when this is done in bad faith. And uh, the other thing is, is the bystanders, the enablers. It's very important, and we know this from the psychology of bullying, that it doesn't take too many people, uh, bystanders, standing up and confronting the bully and say, you know what, we don't like or approve of what you're doing to get the thing stopped. And we need to see more of that. We need to have the other physicians who know what's going on stand up and confront the bully and say, look, uh, we're not going to let you do this. Uh, also, and, and this is key, you need to enlist the help of uh, patients to advocate for legislation that protects good physicians by provi providing better due process and protections. Patients don't know a lot about this. A lot of them are not aware of it unless something happens specifically to them. And a lot of patients may view sham peer review as just a doctor's problem, but it's not a doctor's problem. It's not solely a doctor's problem. It affects patients. And I can tell you, I, I ran a uh, town hall meeting in a little town in Texas where I was uh, asked to explain sham peer review to a group of citizens, and they filled an auditorium on a weeknight to listen. And as a result of what was going on in their community, uh, the surgeons who had complained about poor quality care and some protocols that weren't good for patients in the hospital uh, the hospital administrator sat them down and said, if you continue this, we will label you as disruptive physicians. And they were members of AAPS. They knew what that meant, that it meant they would be looking at the end of their career. So they resigned from the hospital. Well, that left the hospital without any surgical coverage. And this little hospital was about 70 miles away from another, from the next hospital. So if you had some type of acute surgical emergency, uh, chances are, in that area, it, it, you might be uh, adversely affected or even die. 
So they understood that. They understood that it was something that affected them when they start going after uh, physicians uh, inappropriately in hospitals. And if you think about it, if hospitals or others are getting rid of the most skilled and most ethical physicians, what is left? What is left? So uh, I do have a few, uh, few minutes for questions, it looks like, before lunch, and I'm happy to entertain that, and I thank you very much for listening. <laughs>